There is at least a trend in the research for some difference in the adaptations to eccentric versus concentric strength training, particularly if we're talking about forced eccentrics or super maximal eccentrics, okay? So eccentrics tend to produce a greater increase in fascicle length. Fascicles, remember, are the smaller subdivisions of the muscle. It's a bundle of muscle fibers, okay? So larger increase in fascicle length. Also tends to produce more distal hypertrophy, okay? Distal versus proximal. Distal basically means like further from the center of your body or further from the, the origin of the muscle. So on the bicep, for example, distal bicep, proximal bicep, okay? So eccentric training tends to produce more distal hypertrophy. Now, does that mean the increase in fascicle length, the increase in distal hypertrophy, does that mean that sarcomeres are being added in series? Well, I think for a long time it was sort of assumed that, okay, uh, because the fascicle length increases, that means the muscle fiber length increases, that means the myofibril length increases, and so you would think that would mean more, more sarcomeres in series, but turns out sarcomeres can also increase in length, and so then you could get increase in length of the myofibril and the fiber without actually adding more sarcomeres. Uh, for the most part in research, people are just measuring fascicle length. They're not actually counting sarcomeres because it's not easy to count when there's like, you know, 30,000 of something in a, in a 10 centimeter muscle fascicle, right? Um, so it turns out there's a bit of a question there. Some of the research, now that, you know, we're getting better at looking at this stuff, some of it has said like, yeah, when we get an increase in fascicle length, it's maybe just sarcomeres lengthening instead of adding more in series. Uh, but then other research has said the opposite. No, there's actually a massive increase in sarcomere, uh, the number of sarcomeres. And so a bit of a question mark there. Now, concentric strength training tends to produce a larger increase in fiber cross-sectional area, okay, FCSA. Uh, so again, that's that thickening of the muscle fibers that we talked about. Also a larger increase in penation angle, which we talked about. And then... Does that mean that there's more sarcomeres being added in parallel? Well, it turns out this is actually not directly measured either. Um, and so it's really not confirmed. The way that they've tried to confirm it um, hasn't confirmed it. It's actually shown like, oh, maybe it's not what's happening when a muscle fiber gets thicker or when a fascicle gets thicker, right? So kind of some questions there actually. That being said, I mean, we're going to continue talking about this, sort of assuming that this part is true, that sarcomeres in parallel, adding more myofibrils in the muscle fiber is what's going on. Now, key thing to clarify is that these adaptations are not exclusive to these types of training, right? It is not as if eccentric training cannot improve fiber cross-sectional area, right? It's not as if concentric or let's just say traditional strength training doesn't produce any distal hypertrophy, right? It's just there's a bit of a trend where these things tend to happen uh, or these adaptations tend to occur to a greater degree in response to these certain types of muscle actions. In particular, increase in fascicle length is not exclusive to supramaximal eccentrics or forced eccentrics, right? People talk about the increase in fascicle length being this really important adaptation from heavy eccentric things like Nordic hamstring exercise, stuff like that. Um, but it is not exclusive to that. So other factors that very clearly have an influence on fascicle length are range of motion and velocity. So if you train at a longer muscle length, that increases fascicle length compared to training at shorter length. And then also training at higher velocity compared to slower velocity tends to increase fascicle length more. So practically speaking, if you have an athlete who Let's say they, you know, they jump a lot and they have dunk sessions and then they also, you know, do squats and lunges, just normal squats and lunges with full range of motion. If they do supra maximal eccentrics for their quads, will that further increase their fascicle length than dunking and training with full range already did? I don't think we know that. Uh, if we're talking about the hamstrings and a sprinter, you know, they already sprint and then let's say they do just, you know, seated hamstring curls and RDL in the weight room. And so they already have 
long length training. They already have high velocity training. So then is doing a super max eccentric going to make their hamstring fascicles even longer? I don't know. I don't think we have the ability to claim that. In fact, there's a study where they had soccer players who were already doing a bunch of soccer. They had some of them do a linear sprint training program on top of the soccer. And they had some of them do a Nordic hamstring exercise program on top of soccer. And the sprint training group actually increased their fascicle length to a greater degree. So I really don't think we can say that supra maximal eccentrics have a special influence on fascicle length. Compared to doing nothing, yeah, of course. Compared to concentric only strength training, yes. But compared to high velocity training and full range of motion, just traditional strength training, I don't think we can make that claim. Another thing I want to point out, which I've actually pointed this out before, I had a whole series on eccentric training, uh, is that you don't need supra maximal weight in order to achieve a forced eccentric if you utilize momentum. So for example, if you're doing a traditional strength exercise like a down and up squat, if you let the weight get momentum on the way down, let's say with just a normal weight, like 70% of your max, if you let the weight get momentum, when you choose to stop it, there is going to be a forced eccentric happening in that moment that you turn on your maximum effort to stop that weight, okay? So if you consider that, it's like, well, we get a little bit of a forced eccentric in a lot of exercises without doing super maximal weight, all right? And then even body weight stuff when we're moving really fast, right? Uh, again, sprinting in the hamstrings and some of the research on it has really informed us on this where eccentric strength can be improved significantly by just doing linear sprint training. So that's unloaded. Um, but you have high velocity leg movement that the hamstrings are having to stop. This happens in the late swing phase. And so you actually, you know, because of the velocity, the momentum there, um, whether or not it's a forest eccentric in the same, you know, in the same way that a, a super max eccentric is, you know, it, there's probably some differences there, but either way, the fast loading of the hamstrings that happens due to that momentum of the leg um, is enough to increase eccentric strength. And so we're actually getting this type of stimulus from a lot of different places other than a supra max eccentric. So if we consider that these adaptations are not exclusive to eccentrics with supra maximal weight, if we consider that traditional strength training has an eccentric and concentric component, if we consider that we can probably create that forced eccentric or eccentric overload using regular weights and some momentum. If we consider the effects of training with no weight at really high velocity and lots of momentum, like in sprinting or in, you know, approach jumps, that type of thing. If we consider all that. I just don't think that eccentrics with super maximal weight are special. I don't think they're uniquely beneficial. It is certainly a fine variation to do in your intensive strength training. Okay, I'm not criticizing the use of it. I just don't know if it's particularly important or something that you like absolutely have to have in your training. All right. And I have been down this road uh, multiple times, even going back to college 15 years ago, I was doing this with squats, right? Um, I'm, I've done it with myself. I've done it with other athletes. I don't think it has ever produced like some exceptional results compared to just getting stronger in general. Now, if you are going to use it, I think it's actually better suited to smaller, more isolated exercises where you can really focus your effort on that, that target muscle to truly create that stimulus you're going for, that forced lengthening of the muscle. It's a lot harder to do it well on your big compound movements. And it also you know, takes much more effort, it's more work, just the, the plate loading and stuff like that. And then it's gonna produce more fatigue as well. Okay, so I really don't even mess with them on those big movements anymore. I pretty much just do these on <clears throat> hamstring curls or like single leg presses. Okay. So like hamstring and quad exercises. And even then you got to consider the stress of what you're doing and you have to plan that well within the big picture of your training. Right. So I'm not going to do eccentric overload hamstring curls if I'm going to be sprinting anytime in the next like three or four days. Okay. Because it's, it is a, a hard stressor on that muscle and sprinting itself is a hard stressor on that muscle. And so 
yeah, you really, you got to pick your spots to use that type of stimulus. All right, that was kind of a lot. Hopefully it cleared some stuff up for you guys. Hopefully it was helpful. I'm going to post a bunch of links to research in the video description.